Scython. So remember the ne next, next week is the deadline for assignment four. So just make sure that everything is uploaded to your GitHub account. Um, if you need an extension, uh, you can, as always, use the website to apply for a three-day extension. And after next week, there will be a peer review process. Right? So you won't get a assignment next week, but instead you will look at each other's, you will get access to one of your peers' solution, and your task is then to provide constructive feedback to that solution. But I will um, give you some feedback, oh, I, I will give you some information on how that is going to work next week. Yeah, so for now, just uh, focus on finish, finishing assignment four. Right, so now we will talk about Cython. So Cython is is an extension to Python that extends the language itself. So Cython, the Cython language, is a superset of the Python language. And the additional functionality that we get is um, additional type information, specifically the types that we have from the C programming language, and calling C functions. And so from once we've written a Cython program, Cython will then automatically compile that program and generate um, the wrapper code that, um, well, it will generate wrapper code and compile it into a Python module that we then, be, then will be able to use just like if it was a standard Python module. So once compiled, we will see no difference anymore between, from a user's perspective, between a Cython module and a Python module, except that hopefully our Cython implementation will be a lot faster. And so the major advantage of that approach compared to you know, writing a C types version and so on and so forth is that we can do this optimization really incrementally. We will start with a pure Python implementation and slowly convert it into hopefully faster and faster Cython implementation. And there's loads of good documentation online uh, on that website here if you want to. So I just give you an introduction today. So here, here's some of the new um, uh, language features that you have available when you use Cython. So most importantly is that you now can specify the types of variables that you talk about in your program. So for instance, if you have three integers i, j, and k, you can specifically say, you can tell the language that these are integers. And you do that by saying c def int, right? and then the variable names. Same thing if you have um, floating point values. Right? So here. One question there. Float, does that mean float, or does it mean double? Right. Because then when, when in Python, when you, when you say float, they actually mean double. Yes, yes. You know, I think that, good, good question. Yeah. Um, let, um, let me look this up later. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. And so what you do here is, is here three different types that you create. So first, f is a, um, is a normal float value. This is an array of uh, length 42, so 42 elements of floating point values. And here you actually create a pointer to a floating point values. So all the types that you might or not, might not be familiar with uh, C uh, are available through these C, def C definitions here. But you will see that these we don't actually need to use, or at least pointers, we will, we will not need to use them when we use most of the standard Python programs. So then these were the types, and so what about function definitions? So there's three different types, and, uh, three different ways on how you can define functions in Cython. The first one, which I presented here, the first one is just the standard Python way. So you just use def, and then the function name, and then the parameters named. 
The difference here is that now in the, when you provide the arguments, you can also specify which types the arguments have. You, you can, but you, you don't have to. Right? So here I specified the first argument is of type integer, and the second type here is, of, is a string. So it's essentially a pointer to a character. This is how you represent strings in, in C. And so here, um, the important thing is here you use the standard def um, notation. So then there's also C def, and this, if you use C def, then the function definition will only be visible from the C layer, but it, but it will be not exported to the Python layer. So if you have a Cython program and you have an internal function that is only used for computations within that Cython program, but it does not need to be exported to the user perspective, to the, uh, to the, to the, Python mod, to the compiled Python module, then you can use the C def. So then it's only um, internal, so to speak. And so same thing here, right? So the, um, the syntax is similar, so you can specify the types of the input variables. And in front of the uh, function name, you can also specify the type that the function returns. So here, this function x returns an integer. Or it, it has, by specifying it this way, it has to return an integer. And then, for some functions, it might also be useful to have both the Python and the C function. And then, in that case, you can use the cpdef. But the, the other syntax is the same. And so again, these types here that you provide as the return type and the input types, you can specify them, but you don't need to. Um, but of course, the compiler might benefit from the fact that you provide them. Is there any way to specify a general Python object as an argument? So if you, if you don't specify the type, yeah. then it will be compatible to any type that you provide. So then you can pass in any Python object, for instance. So then you have to check what type it is. And well, yeah. So if you don't specify a, the type of a variable or the return type of a function, it, default, it just defaults to a standard Python object, which can represent anything from integers, floats, to any um, uh, class object. And then if you want to loop over items, you can just use, the, or if you want to write a loop, you just implement the standard loop. So for instance, for i in range n, to loop from 0 to n minus 1. But if you now, if this n here, or if, sorry, if, if the index i here is, if you haven't specified the type in advance, then you will just run a normal Python loop. But if you declare the type of i in the line above here, so for instance with cdef int i, specifically making uh, i an integer, then this loop here will optimize into a standard C loop. So you expect then this loop to be a lot faster. So these are the types of optimizations that we then can do. So let's look at an example. Our example will be to approximate a integral of a function. So the integral of a function is simply the, um, the area um, below a function. And so if it's above zero, then it will be additive. And if it's below zero, it will be, uh, it will be subtracted from the integral. And so the way we do that is um, we approximate this integral because we don't know the function analytically. So what we do is we always we essentially um, put little bricks below that function. So we always evaluate the function point at one point and then assume that it's constant for a little um, piece. And then we evaluate the function again, assume that it's constant for a little piece, and you get this kind of step function, the green step function that you see below that function. And we know the area of a rectangle, right? and so we just add this up to get the total approximate area of the function. So how do you do that? 
a simple Python function. Um, in fact, a simple Cython implementation um, can be just our standard Python implementation. So our first Cython implementation is just a standard Python program. And here's how I've written this up. So uh, what do we need? We need our function f that we want to um, integrate over. And then here's our integrate function. It just it takes the starting point of our where the integral should start, then the end point of the integral, and the number of um, the step size that we want to take. And so, sorry, the number of intervals that we want to have. And so then from that number of intervals, we can work out what the step size is. So it's just b minus a, so the end point minus the starting point divided by the number of steps. This is the width of every rectangle that we want to compute. And then we loop over all the number of uh, indices <coughs> oh, over the um, um, number of steps that we want to take and evaluate the function f at a, so the starting point, plus i times dx. Right? So at every starting point of our uh, rectangle, we evaluate the function and then we add that to our s. So s will be our accumulated integral. We start at zero and then keep adding the, um, the area of that integral. So, um, yeah, so I could have moved this dx up here, but I decided to. I need to scale by the, by the width of the rectangle here at the very end. So this is just a standard Python limitation, but we can, we can already use this as a Cython program. So if we run this with standard Python, it takes about 3.5 seconds on 1 million um, rectangles. <coughs> so what do we do? In order to make this a Python, uh, a Cython implementation, is we take our Python implementation and just rename it to, if the original was called integral.py, we just rename it to integral.pyx. So the pyx ending is typically used for Cython endings. And so nothing else changes, right? So the code, any Python code, is also legal Cython code. But now, the difference is that now we will compile our Cython program. So um, the, what we need to do is we, we first call the Cython compiler, so Cython integral.pyx, and that would actually create a integral.c file. And that's the C implementation of our um, of our Python program. So we, we take the program, convert it into C program, and then we compile it again into a Python module. So you, you can actually, you, if you want, you can look at the integral.c afterwards and you will see the, um, the entire wrapper code that I was talking about that you normally have to do manually. Right? Here we have the Cython compiler that creates it, us, creates it for us um, automatically. And then we need to compile the C program, and I use the GCC compiler here. Um, yeah, it's uh, a bit lengthy and it's not so important. I, I'll show you in the next slide a more automated way in how you compile it. But essentially, it's a compilation step, and there's a, a, a here, there's a linking step where I convert it into <coughs> this shared library, an SO um, file. But once you've done this, you have this new file, integral.so, and that can be used just as any standard Python module. So after all this compilation, we can again use from integral import f and integrate f. So we have the functions available. So this um, compiling here by, by hand is maybe a bit inconvenient, especially if you have many Python modules. Um, and sometimes you have to hard code the path. So here I specify that I'm using Python 3, for instance, or um, so that maybe you use a different compiler on your system. You know, so it's maybe not always good to hard code these comp compilation steps. Much more convenient way of doing it is to create a so-called setup.py file. So a setup.py file is a way to um, describe how your script or module that you're coding up should be installed uh, on a system. And 
uh, Python comes with this module distutals dist that simplifies or facilitates installing modules and packages. And so a simple way of um, compiling the Cython files is if you make a setup.py file in your full, in your where you have your code with that with the content in here. So you need the Cythonize package that allows you to the, allows the setup script to automatically compile these uh, Cython scripts. Then essentially you have a set you call the setup function. You just give it a name. This could be the name of your of your project, and then these ext modules. This is where you specify the files that should be automatically compiled as part of your project. So you say Cythonize, and then here it just says start.pyx, meaning please compile any pyx files that are in my folder. So once you've created the setup.py file, then instead of having to um, type in the, the compilation commands manually, you can just call Python setup.py, um, and here's the build x means build the external modules, right? This is the accumulation steps. And then in place simply means put the shared objects that you compile in the same directory that I'm working in right now. <coughs> so I'm not sure if you, maybe we can try this out. I think I have a, So let's see. So I have the setup.py file here. You can you can look at it. This is exactly what I've just explained. Uh, what I went through in a second, and then I also have this pyx file here. This is now a more advanced version of that. Um, of this is not a pure Python implementation anymore, but it's still a. Um, it's still a Cython file. And now what I can do is I can copy this line here. So probably use Python 3. Oh yeah, and so I had actually, I just delete all the .so files so that it does something. Right, and so here's where the compilation goes. So here you can see the commands that I've shown you before by hand a bit more, con with more options here. And there's actually a warning here that I'm using some deprecated NumPy API and so on and so forth. But at the end, now it compiled, there was no error. And if I, um, there should be now a, uh -huh. yeah, there's now a integral.cpython35m, blah, 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 dot, dot so file. That's the important part. Now if I go into an ipython3 shell, I can do, import integral. I can check what I have here. Integral dot integrate f. Here's my integrate f function. So really so far we haven't done very much, right? We've taken our standard Python implementation, converted it into C and generated wrapper code again so that we can call it from Python again. And so if you do that, I mean, sometimes you get a little bit of a speed up, but really um, um, the main problem is essentially that you're constantly going, you, you, we now have the C compiled module, but so when we call a function, then we go into the C layer, but then inside the C layer, we might call a Python function again, right? Um, the sinus functions, for instance, and then we have to go back outside into the Python implementation of sinus, and so there's a constant uh, going back and forth between Python and C, which will be still very, very slow. So in order to really get a speed up, we need to tell our implementation about the types that we use in our program. And that's when you get the real, real speed up. And so here's now a typed version of um, of the original program. So the first thing that you can see is that um, maybe let's start, let's start down here inside the loop. So here when we loop over all the indices for i in range n, 
now I specify which type this i has, right? I write c def int i. The same thing here with the length, the width of the of the rectangle. I know it's a, this is a um, well in this case this answers your question, right? So here you always use the c type. So here I specifically say it's a double. So I write c def double dx equals b minus n. Right, so I could have used float for single position, but here I want double position, so I write double. Same thing for, for the integral itself. I specify c def double s. And then down here in, in the computations, I don't actually have to change anything. I've already specified all the types, so the computation can stay as they are. So then here in the function definition, I here make the function available both from C and Python, and I specify the return type, so I know my integral is of type double, because I return s times dx, and both dx and s are of type double, so the, the multiply together, they will be double as well. And then as inputs, I get the starting value, and I expect this to be a double, and a end value, I expect this a double, and the number of um, Segments is also going is going to be an integer. Okay. And then the last thing that I do is that in um, instead of here the sinus function, by default, um, Python will use the Python implementation of the sinus function. But I wanted to use the C implementation of the Python function so that we don't have to go from once here we are in the side the C layer. Once we hit the F evaluation, I don't want it to go back, having go to go back to the Python layer. So I want it to stay to the C in the C layer. So I import this libc from the libc module, which is the C implementation dot math import sinus function that allows me to stay in the C layer all the time. And so what I've done, okay. The last things that I want to do is I also want to provide the types for the for the actual f, which I hadn't done before. So here now I specify that f takes in a double x and it returns a double x. Right, and so see here now, um, this f function is only internal. It's not, it's only used as part of the integration, but the, the user actually never, never needs to see the f implementation. So I can just use a c def here rather than a a CP def. Okay. And so if you do the timings for this, you will see that there's, you will get significant amount of improvements once you go from the pure Python implementation to the C implementation. And this improvement will be even higher once you go from a single loop, right? So here we only have one loop where we loop over the number of uh, X coordinates. If you have an example where we loop over the X and Y coordinates, so these nested loops, then you get an even better speed. But let's look at some timing values that I've created. So this is now uh, some time is compared for, for different implementations, Cython implementations. So here was the pure Python implementation. So no, not using Cython at all. And again, it's normalized, so we get 1.0. Then we did the compilation step without adding any types. So this is just using Cython on our original Python code. So then you already um, reduce it by 25 or 26% here. Let's say we go to 0.74. Then I added the, I specified the um, double types. So both in the function inputs and in the, when it, in computing the integral. But, so that reduced it a little bit, right? But the main loop was still, uh, was still in, uh, that's the it's integer specification, so the main loop was still in Python. So then I converted the main loop into 
uh, into C. And so immediately we top significantly. So now we're going from 1 to 0 0.4. But we're still now calling the um, sinus function in Python. So the, the last step is then to tell Scython to use the uh, C version of the sinus function. And that's when you again gain almost a factor of 4. So you go from, from 0.4 to 0.1. And so this is, again, this is the motivation for using Scython is that you can essentially start with your Python implementation and you can really step by step improve your, the performance of your code by um, annotating the types that you're using. So for NumPy, things become a bit more uh, complicated, but it also works. So if you want to use uh, Scython and NumPy, Here's an example. So if you, if you have a function that applies the sign, the sinus on, on an array, um, this is a pure uh, Python implementation. So apply sinus takes, a, takes an array, creates a new output array, that has the same length of, as our input arrays and is of type double. And then we loop over all the, over every entry and, and compute the sinus um, of the input array and stored in the output array. So now let's say, so of course this could be vectorized, right? But let's say we want to use instead Scython on this. So, okay, this is how you use it. Um, you first create a input array and then you then you call your output function. So now let's, let's start using Scython on, on this. So the first important thing is that, um, you know, NumPy, NumPy arrays always have specific data types. And so there's equivalent data types for Scython that you need to use. Then here's the conversion table. So if your original NumPy data type that you used was NumPy.double, like in our case, then our Scython data dev has to be numby.wt. And so the same thing for if you use integers or complex functions and so on. So, you know, I think, let me just go back. I think actually the table is the wrong. Oh, yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, now, when we create our new NumPy array in Scython, right, then we need to specify the type of, um, of the NumPy array. So the second line here is the original uh, Python code. And the line above now is the Scython code. So we use a cdef to specify the type. And we say we have now a NumPy ND array. And uh, we specif we have, then we have these um, brackets here. Uh, specifying the type, so numpy.double t, and there's an underscore missing here, double t. So this is now exactly the, the original type converted into the, into the Scython type. You just have to add this underscore t here. And it's a one-dimensional array. So I just say n to be equals one, and the name is out. And this is how Scython then knows that the following variable here has that specific type. So that's essentially the most important thing. And now you can just follow uh, exactly the same strategy as we've seen before. So you take your original function and then you add all these CDEFs. So what specifically what are we doing here is we, well, the first thing is in our loop here, right? We have this integer that we loop over, we convert that into a CDEF. Then we have the output and the, uh, the output numpy array that we can CDEF here as I've shown before. But the same thing also for the input, uh, for the input variables. So our apply sinus had takes in a numpy array, right, which I specify in here, and they're all of type double T and they're all one dimensional. So here it's fairly easy. And the same thing again for the output variable. It's a one dimensional numpy array. And again, I want to make use of the um, of the fast 
uh, C version of sinus. So I add that in, in here as well. And the last thing to remember here is that when you import NumPy, you also need to import the C version of NumPy. OK? So then you save this as apply.py.x as a Cython file. And then once you've compiled it, you can lose, use it just like um, any other Python module. So from this apply, import apply sinus, and then you can just call it on, um, you can call the apply sinus to a standard numpy array. But here you need to make sure that you type matches now, right? So this apply sinus we've compiled specifically for numpy arrays of type double. So if you try to call this now for a different array, it will fail. So here's some speed ups. Our pure Python implementation takes, if it takes one second, then the Cython implementation takes 0.2 seconds. And then if I vectorize that version, it actually only takes 0.2 seconds as well. So in this specific case, because I can vectorize, you can see that there's not much difference between Cython, Cython and NumPy. But you know for programs that you can't vectorize, then Cython will definitely win. So in summary, so Cython pros and cons. So Cython, one advantage is that you can essentially start with the Python implementation. You can incrementally make it better and faster. Uh, and um, in, you almost, you need very, very little overhead. Right? There's no need to write complicated wrapper codes. Uh, um, and it also, th this I haven't shown you, you can also use Cython to access C libraries. So assuming that you already have a C library on your system and you just want to access it, you can also use the Cython module for that. And um, one of the disadvantages is that it's, you still have to do some, you still need to think about the types that you're writing um, and it has limitations. So if you, um, you have less control, so to, uh, to say for, um, for large libraries that might be complicated. Um, Cython will hit its limits. And there's something called SWIC that can be used for really, really large projects if you want to wrap them. Um, yeah, but in general, I think Cython, if you, if you want to do mixed Python, Cython is definitely one of the maybe first choices that you should, uh, should consider. But now comes the really uh, magic part because now I will show you how to a number in another package called number, and that essentially automates what you had to do in Cython. So number is a so-called a just-in-time compiler for Python. And the way it works is, essentially the way it works is that um, when you run your program, and you hit a certain function, right before, before the, if you just look at the, at the function defini definition itself, there's no way Python will know which types um, will be passed into that function, right? And for that reason, it can't optimize that function. But when you're running the program and you're hitting that function, then you're passing in specific types, right? And at that point in time, Python does know which types you're operating on. And this is where number comes in. So number then, while your program is running, it will look for the functions that you're telling it to optimize. It will look at the function. It will look at the types that you pass into that function at one time. And then it will create essentially what Cython does. Right? It will put in automatically the types that you've passed in, compile I create a compiled version of that module and then execute that instead of the original Python um, function. And so, of course, I mean, the, the idea is really, really great. And, and so, of course, the first time it's going to be slow because you have to check the types and you have to compile things. It needs to compile things and so on and so forth. But now if you execute this 
a million times the function, right? So then you will benefit. And so also the next time you call that fun the program again, right, it will cache the compiled version and it will be fast again. And so this is the idea of just entire compilation for Python. And so, um, yeah, the idea is that you automatically convert Python code into highly efficient compiled code on in one time. So it's a, it's an, you need to install that package, so it's not part of the standard uh, Python environment. But it's very, very simple to use. So essentially what you need to do is you need to import the module so from number import just in time JIT. Just in time is the keyword here. And then what you do is you take your function that you want to optimize and you just decorate this. Again, this is a decorator with this add symbol. You add this decorator at JIT in front of the function. And that's it. Right? So now number is activated. It will look for that. Whenever you call that function, it will, um, uh, it will compile it on time and then make it faster. Let's see if we have some, right? I mean, so here, here I just executed and so you see you get at least a value out, but we can uh, now compare the different results. So I have a pure Python implementation of um, just summing up a uh, two dimension, is it a two dimensional array here? The values in a two dimensional array. I've, I have a pure Python implementation. Um, of that, and then I have a Python implementation where I just added this at just in time line. And so here's the time at numbers. Um, the pure Python implementation takes 300 milliseconds uh, per evaluation. And then if you use the just in time compiled version, you get one millisecond. So just one, adding one line of code, we got a 300 times speed up. Does it make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Before we finish, I just wanted to mention this setup.py thing that you need for your last assignment. So um, the setup.py files, they essentially, they're used to make your package or your module installable for um, for other people. And so this is a typical directory for a structure that uh, you can use for, um, uh, yeah, for, for a package that you're developing, let's say. So the main directory name, and this could be maybe your GitHub repository, is just, this is the PDE solver. This is where the entire, in my case, right, I have a solver for partial differential equation. So then I, I, this is the main folder where I have everything inside. So then in, directly in there, I have the setup.py file, and I'll show you in a second what, should, what you should write in there. Um, then you might also want to have a file stating the requirements that need to be also installed when you uh, install your package, and maybe a readme file. And so then you have a subfolder. This is your package folder. Right. This is where you store the actual code in. And in my case, it's called PDE solver. And then in order to make this a package, we have these underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. The underscores are never visible here. And then you know that I have a sub package here called numerics. Again, I have an init file and I have another subfolder and so on and so forth. But so this is, this is kind of a very common structure that you find in Python, uh, Python programs that you might want to replicate. And so the setup.py file, that if you have this installed properly, or if you have this coded up properly, it allows you to essentially install your, your package here with just one line. You can type pip3 install dot, if you, dot just means this, look at the setup file in your current directory, and minus minus user if you want to install it in your, just in a user, single user installation, or just pip3 install dot if you want to install the system wide. There's also, um, you can even, 
then if you upload this directory structure on, on a GitHub account, uh, on, a, on a GitHub repository, you can even do pip3 install and then the name of the GitHub repository. Then it will automatically download your GitHub repository, look for the setup.py file and install it. So that's the, that's the benefit of having the setup script. And so this is, for instance, if you use pip is this Python package manager, very similar to Conda. Um, this is automatic. If you, this is also used when you install other packages. Right? So in, for instance, if you want to install SciPy, which is the sci scientific Python version, um, essentially there's a, a global uh, package index, and it will search for the SciPy package in here. We'll look for the setup.py file inside that uh, inside that package and then install it uh, accordingly. So the setup.py file is really is the file that makes your, your modules installable. And essentially, they are just really really simple. And I've shown you more complicated. The more complicated version of that was actually when I showed you the, this how do you compile Python files. But if you just have pure Python a pure Python module, then you essentially only need these uh, few lines here. So you import, so this is how the setup.py files look like. You import the setup function from this dist audience core, and then you essentially call it. And you need to have a few arguments. You need to provide a name. This should be the name of your, of your package. Then you can have a version. And this is actually the most important one. Packages equals, and this is just a list of module names or directory names that should be installed when you, um, when the user installs it, right? And so here, PDE Solver, this was the folder that I had where I had all my packages in, my modules in, right? So here, if you look at my directory search again, here was the PDE Solver. This is, and I'm instructing setup.py to install this subfolder here. And so afterwards, everything um, in that subfolder will be available. Does that make sense? Just want to, to finish off. Yeah, one question. Where do you have three you know, I th okay, good question. But I think it is sufficient to, if you specify only the PDE solver folder here, it will automatically install every all the subfolders in as well. So. You know, in Germany, because you always clap at the end of the lectures, which is really, really nice. But there's, you know, in Germany, what, what students do? Anyone? So when the lecture ends, the German students do that. And do you know why they do that? It's, you know, Germans are very efficient. It's because they can pack their stuff at the same time as when they clap. But you know, in Norway, I don't think you normally don't clap, right? No, there's no need to clap. I'm very happy without clapping. So see you next week instead. <laughs> <laughs>